Uh, we're excited to host Rob Stavens, who's a professor of business and government at Harvard. Uh, the research he's going to show you today has been exemplified in the NFL and, and MLB, so it's very widely applicable. So please join me in welcoming Rob Stavens. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here. The first thing I want to say is that as a professor, I've been at quite a few student organized conferences over decades, and I've never been at a student organized conference that is as well organized as this one. So thank you and congratulations to all of you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about winning strategies for ticket pricing, what secondary market data do and importantly do not uh, tell you. Although I'm a, a professor at Harvard, this work that I'm going to describe to you this morning is, in fact, joint work with some colleagues of mine at Analysis Group, which is an economic and strategy consulting firm headquartered here in Boston. Andy Paris and Noam Kirsten uh, and others are in the room. Um, but let me tell you at first what it is that we're going to talk about. I'm going to start by trying to give you a brief introduction in terms of some background, uh, what the purpose is essentially of this kind of analysis, get a sense of what the value of it is, and then we're going to look at the analytical methods themselves, and then I am going to provide some illustrative uh, results and the kind of output that comes from this work. So to start with the background, uh, every day in ordinary markets around the world for all sorts of goods and services, the interaction of the forces of supply and demand yield market clearing prices, by which I mean those prices that just barely sell inventory. So in market economies, we don't have severe shortages or extreme surpluses. But in professional sports, the true market clearing price, the market value of tickets is in some cases greater than the face value, and in some cases is less than face value. And the true market clearing, the true market value of these tickets almost always varies more than face value, according to the location of seats, amenities associated with seats, timing of games, and a host of other factors. And we know this by looking at the secondary market. But one of the major points I want to convey is that very careful analysis is required to develop reliable estimates of true market clearing prices in the primary market. Uh, in fact, secondary market prices on their own are often highly misleading. So the analysis I'm going to use employs advanced but actually well-established statistical methods that we have used successfully with Major League Baseball teams such as the Boston Red Sox and NFL teams such as the Miami Dolphins. But in naming those two teams, I want to emphasize that we've used this work and have been involved with major market teams and small market teams, with teams that have the longest sellout streak in the history of sports, and with teams that have a hard time putting enough seats uh, filled to even break even. So to give you one uh, example of this, a real world application, the Miami Dolphins turned to us to help develop a pricing plan uh, for the 2010 season, both for season tickets and for tickets for individual games. Using an econometric analysis, a statistical analysis that I'm going to show to you, we evaluated consumer demand, we estimated market clearing prices, and we recommended a new pricing approach. As a result, the Dolphins increased ticket prices for about half of the seats, they left prices unchanged for about a third of the seats, and they lowered prices for 15% of the seats. And importantly, they also created some new seating categories we recommended. According to the Dolphins, the result of that was they increased both attendance and revenue. So that's the first possible objective of this kind of ticket value analysis, is increasing attendance or revenue, which are not necessarily the same thing. But there's also improving the quality of ticket services for, for fans. And in fact, the way I originally got into this work is as a season ticket holder myself of some sports franchises and as a fan. Because like other fans, I w dislike sitting next to someone who paid less than I did for the same quality seat. Or paying the same amount as someone else who has a better quality seat. Better pricing, like I'm going to show you, reduces price differentiation by the source of the ticket 
and it increases price differentiation by the quality of the ticket. And that's why this analysis is not only useful for teams, not only good for revenue, but actually is good for fans. There's also, of course, the objective of addressing a wide variety of investment questions and improving the understanding on the part of the team of the real market value of its assets. Now, for all these objectives, what one really needs to know is the true market demand for tickets, how much people value specific seats for specific games. In fact, more than that, how much they value the individual attributes of individual seats for individual games. But this tr true market demand is simply unknown in advance because the face values do not interact, do not reflect the true interaction of forces of supply and demand in the market. The quantity is set. Now, I promise you I'm not going to take you through equations, but I want to at least show you a demand curve. And that demand curve, that blue downward sloping line, is showing that for this particular stadium, we have a willingness to pay, which is very high over on the left for the highest quality seats, and then it diminishes for the lower quality seats. And what's happening in this case is that they've got two sections, section A and B, at those two prices. And section A is selling out, but that red triangle is money left on the table. In addition to that, section B is not selling out because some of the seats are not of sufficient quality to justify the price. So that is got, they have both the problem of limited differentiation in that section B, and they've got the problem of prices too high for some seats. So what do we do? The first thing is to drop some prices by creating a new subsection. It's the new section C at lower price. Now there's left money left on the table. The red areas have diminished, and we're selling out by going to a lower price, not for all of section B, but creating a new section where appropriate. Now, depending upon the shape of demand, uh, it's possible to increase revenue in section A actually by raising prices in a way that would sacrifice attendance. I'm actually going to focus in this talk on selling out as opposed to mixing the two together. So what we do here is we've divided up what was section A into four subsections of diminishing quality and therefore of diminishing price, addressing both an increase in revenue and the satisfaction of those complaints that would come from the fans that I described earlier. But some games are of particular high demand. Now that might be because it's in a particular opponent or in the, in the case of an outdoor sport, such as Major League Baseball, it could be the peak season when the demand is very high, July and August, essentially, compared to certainly April, May, and typically September. So now we have this situation that a lot is being left on the table, even with the better pricing. So what do we do is put in place variable pricing, that is higher prices for certain sections for particular key games. These key games might be interleague games in the case of baseball. They might be particular opponents in the case of the NFL. Now, I want to emphasize this shouldn't be confused with dynamic pricing, which is, of course, actually changing pricing during the season, responding to conditions of changing demand. This analysis is also exceptionally helpful for that because of time constraints. I'm not going to get into it. In Q&A, I would be delighted to get into dynamic pricing. So that's the background and the motivation. Now let's look at the methods. I'm using hedonic analysis. It's a well-accepted accepted statistical approach that reveals the relationship between a product's attributes and a, the market price. When we buy a product, we're actually buying a bundle of a lot of different attributes of that product. It's been extensively used. I teach it at Harvard. I've used it in other industries, including automobiles, computers, and airline tickets. And one thing I should say, if you were with me in the previous session when the question was asked, what's the sophistication in professional sports of ticket pricing compared to airlines, my answer is not even close. Now, some teams do a great job and are doing an even better job. But looking across the sports, we're not close to where airlines are in terms of the sophistication of pricing, using methods, by the way, exactly like I'm going to show you. So this is just a schematic. I'm going to start by telling you about the inputs to the model. Here we have a stylized uh, uh, and symmetric, in this case, uh, ballpark. And we've got observations of secondary market ticket sales, which might be from StubHub, it might be from some other source, at various places around the ballpark. And then for one particular seat, although we'll do this for every ticket that's on the market, we'll get a secondary market sale price. I'll tell you how. And then we'll also bring in other data, the attributes of the location. 
the seeding section, the distance to the field, the distance to home plate, the angle of view to the batter's box, the elevation and the viewing pitch, and other amenities ranging from parking privileges to club seats to even cup holders. But in addition to that, of a great importance are the temporal attributes. Who's the opponent? What's the day of the week? What's the time of the game? What's the expected weather? Not the actual weather for dynamic pricing, but for this setting prices at the beginning of the season, what's the expected weather, i.e. the climate at that time of the year? And of course, changing through the season playoff contention. Finally, there are attributes of the ticket sale itself from the secondary market, the number of seats together, which as you can imagine is quite important, and the time from sale to game day because of the pattern we regularly observe with pricing on the secondary market. Now, the data on the secondary market transactions can be obtained directly if the individual team has a relationship with a uh, secondary market uh, seller. StubHub is an example, but not the only one. But if the team doesn't have that kind of relationship, then we've developed a proprietary method for obtaining by automatically harvesting from websites and then systematically organizing the data which is there and is publicly available. And we've tested that out and compared it numerous times to getting the data directly. So that's the input, now the analysis, the model itself. So this is a statistical analysis. I'm going to give you a very simple, simplified graphical description of the mathematical model, and it's as follows. We're going to break down the price of a ticket into the component prices that the market values, not that I do, but the market is valuing through the interaction of supply and demand on the secondary market of these attributes. First, the fact that it's a field box seat, and we might also have packed into that distance from the field, brings a component of the pricing, a willingness to pay for that attribute. It turns out it's behind home plate. The market told us for this particular game, that was an additional $15. It's a Tuesday night. Turns out that was low demand compared to the average, uh, we, uh, an increment of $5 off. And then it turns out its opponent is a team that's always in contention, might even be a rivalry, the Boston Red Sox, and so we throw, th then it turns out that the market has demonstrated a 20 for that. And that would be a way in which we look at the components of it. But let me emphasize, I've used four attributes here. What we look at are 35 to 50 attributes of each ticket, temporally and, s and spatially. And importantly, as you can imagine, these attributes interact. They don't simply add up the way that I've uh, shown you right here. So now for uh, the execution of the model. Uh, this econometric analysis is based on secondary market activity. And in fact, the secondary market activity uh, is large. It varies from, in some cases, 30% of every ticket over a season. In some cases, it's as low as 2 or 3%, but it's still very large numbers. And that means that the samples are large and statistically precise. However, very important, the tickets that are on the secondary market are not representative of the universe of tickets in the ballpark or stadium. They are not. They are systematically different. In some cases, the, the uh, games that are favored because of the opponent are on the market, sometimes the undesirable games, sometimes the best seats in a given section, usually the worst seats in a given section. So the secondary market is not representative of the entire uh, stadium. And since we're interested in the pricing for the team, not what goes on in the secondary market, we have to adjust for that. So what we're going to do is figure out the pricing of all the individual attributes and then repackage them for the typical seat in a given section, then we can tell us what the market really is saying about the average game, if that's what we want, or if you want to know what the market would say for the, a particular game, or you'd like to know what it would be for field box 23, row J, seats three and four, April 25th, then we'll simulate that as well. So the face value in this example, uh, unadjusted, is $40, and the secondary market average was, as you can see, considerably more than that, and this is not unusual, actually $185. But it's not representative of what's really going on, so that $185 can be misleading. Through this hedonic process, we get to what I'd call the regression adjusted value, which is $120. But that's still the secondary market. We still need to get to the primary market. 
So let's do that. The problem is that the primary market differs from the secondary market you know, in one way in addition to the fact that the tickets are not representative, it's that the people are not representative. The people that populate on demand side, that buy tickets on the secondary market, are not typical of all fans. They're not representative of the larger fan base. They may well, in many cases, have a significantly higher willingness to pay, which is why they're on the secondary market. They're willing to pay those higher prices. So we incorporate some additional information from the team. We use a proprietary methodology, essentially to correct for, for that bias. And therefore, we go from what I've described to you as these corrected secondary market ticket prices to the true market clearing price on the primary market. So, for example, we started out with a face value of $40. The secondary uh, market sample average that you might observe at StubHub was $185. When we adjusted that for the fact that the tickets were not representative, we got down to $120. And then importantly, we, we adjusted it for the difference in fan base, essentially simulating what would happen if you threw all of the tickets onto a secondary market. You just sold them all that way. It came to $70. $70 is greater than $40, but it's a lot less than $185. That's why I say properly analyzing secondary market data can be exceptionally helpful, but just taking it at face value itself, just taking that secondary market data of itself can be highly misleading. Now, I've given the example, let me say, of a, a team in which is, in this case, underpricing tickets, but the, oppo the opposite can happen. In fact, they happen in the same ballpark or same stadium. So we might have section B that was selling at face value of $250. Its secondary market sample average, though, was only $120, which is telling us something. But when we adjust that for the tickets that are out there, it turned out that was actually $160. And then when we made the adjustment for the fan base, $175. So yes, $175 is less than $250, but it's a lot more than what you might have thought if you simply looked at the secondary market sample averages themselves. So now to wrap this up, let me take a look at outputs and uh, illustrative results. They're illustrative. Neither of the teams that I mentioned earlier am I revealing to you the results that we've come up with in my work with them over the years. So the analysis output. Fa here are face values. You can see these sound like uh, football sections, tickets ranging in price from $500 to $55. We found that the market clearing price here in this stylized version would go from $230 down to a low of $55. What does this tell us? Well, the first thing to take note of here is that there's a correlation. Those flag charts are of similar shape. So face value and market clearing prices are correlated, suggesting that the team does understand the relative value of seating categories, but there's still evidence of what you could call mispricing in several sections. So if you want to look at that in terms of the difference, those seats at the top to the, the flags to the left of the vertical line, those are overpriced. And then you've got some ones down at the bottom are underpriced, both in dollars and then in percentages. So 54% uh, overpriced to 34% underpriced. But looking at those numbers alone is really not sufficient. We have to take account of the capacity of the individual sections. And frequently, it's the case that modest percentage increases in large capacity sections can, of course, have very significant revenue implications. Now, what I've shown you there is just a stylized version. Needless to say, the output of this kind of analysis is pages and pages of very detailed tables by sections, by rows, by seats, really breaking it down. There's also the possibility, and where the core is really of, I think, our contribution in this kind of work, is not just so much saying what the pricing should be of the seat categories you have, but how you could change your ticket pricing strategy itself. So there are spatial refinements in ticket pricing, such as improving the boundaries between existing sections, and frequently creating new sections to better account for price differentiation, as in that graphic example I gave you with the demand curve at the very beginning. Also, in some cases, consolidating sections. And then there are intertemporal refinements, essentially variable ticket pricing. There could be peak season pricing, as in the case of baseball, because of it being an outdoor uh, sport, by the time of day, the day of the week, by the opponent, so on and so forth. All of those are possibilities, and frequently huge potential uh, gains in in revenue. So to conclude this, and then we can take your, your questions or your comments, 
Uh, let me just say two things. Um, the first is that secondary market data, as I hope I've conveyed to you, um, can be very, very helpful in terms of improving ticket pricing. But I, as I hope I've also conveyed, very careful analysis of the secondary market data is absolutely crucial. And if it's done right, proper analysis of secondary market data can lead to better pricing strategies, which I am convinced from personal experience uh, improves both the fan experience and also team revenues. So I am going to stop there. Before we go to uh, Q&A now, I want to remind you this work is joint. My colleagues, some of them are here. Matt Notowidigdo, who is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago at the Booth School, um, works on this with me. He was unable to be here. But Andy Paris and Noam Kirsten from Analysis Group are here. And um, if you want to follow up beyond the Q&A, then certainly during the break, um, see one of us in the hallway or whatever. And with that, let me ask the organizers to um, ask for questions. So it seems like uh, you would want to try and vary, uh, you know, create as many different pricing categories as possible to sort of capture all that demand. Where do you draw the line between uh, trying to, to value each seat uh, at a different price and, you know, becoming prohibitively expensive by, you know, creating too many categories? So I, I think you, you know, you answered the, the question yourself. I mean, you're, you're, you're your premise is correct. There are two factors, and they go in opposite directions. The ideal, were it not for some factors I'm going to say, would be what economists call perfect price discrimination. We'd have, remember that man curve, we would just have these little bars, and all the red would be gone. But there are two realities. One, in the old days, when we had all hard copy uh, ticket sales up at the booths, most of you aren't old enough to remember that, um, there would be the transactions costs involved in having a lot of different, category, different categories. Nowadays, given the electronics, those transaction costs of different categories are relatively trivial. However, there's essentially hostility and confusion even, confusion and even hostility from the fan base. So there's a substantial trade-off. And that's a judgment call. It's a judgment call in which this analysis helps, but that's fundamentally a judgment the team makes. How do you uh, account for uh, ticket buyers who just don't care about the actual seat, they just have the temporal, want to see that opponent, where you're trying to break down all the different categories, but they just want to go to the game. They don't well, care if it's 106 or, you know, 210. I'm, I'm sorry, I, last, I lost the last little bit you said. They don't care if it's 106 seating in right field or if it's left field in the bleachers, they just want to see the game. Well, what, what we're doing is not imposing upon it. You know, this is not like the experts saying, what the value is, this is the market. And those people who feel that way, then they feed into the analysis. And we go through the strategies with an individual team on what comes from this, then we identify if there are these different particular segments of the market, what appeals to them. Now, in some stadium settings, that would, what you described would be the case because t fans are allowed to move around at will. There are other stadiums where it's absolutely impossible to change you know, a, a section at all, in which case that's less the case. Um, can you can you go into a little more depth about how I was following sort of how you are, were adjusting the prices and you got up to the regression price? How did you? What did you do from the regression price to the final price that you ultimately recommended? So it's it's not surprising that you sense that I did not go into detail on that because I'm not going to. Um, so that's something at which we go into great detail when presenting the approach both to an anticipated clients in any of the major sports and, which, and when we do the analysis that they fully understand. But you know, I've essentially laid out here um, how to do it. And that part I'm afraid I'm going to keep proprietary. What, I, what I'll tell you is that, uh, and I guess you've, you've taken my word for it, you know, um, not as a consultant, I hope as, a, as an academic, that this is a very, very rigorous way we use to get from the secondary market to the primary market. It is reliable. So, I'm sorry, I can't say more. Given that, given that secondary exchanges and marketplaces state a face value in most cases, have you found that to be a statistically significant factor 
in I, a secondary market. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get the very first part. It's given that on most secondary exchanges and marketplaces, there is a stated face value. Oh, yeah. That's listed. Do you find that to be a factor in and of itself, uh, in effect, as an anchoring effect? Yes. So the, answer, the short answer is yes, the face value matters, and that's one of the things you can learn from empirical research as opposed to being theoretical. As an economist coming into that, I wouldn't necessarily have expected that. I would think it's only the attributes matter. One of the two things come out. One is that the face value does affect people on on the market, both uh, probably on the supply side as well, their asking price, as well as the perceived value of it. And the other is the name of the section matters, right? I mean, in, in, in a hyper-rational world, it doesn't matter if it's called field box or lousy section. What matters is where you're located, distance of the field, angle to home, but it does matter. It does matter. The names of sections have an effect. Um, you mentioned you had 30 plus attributes across the ticket and temporal attributes. Yeah. How many of those are actually material? So the opponent is clearly there, but at what point does it have diminishing returns? And then did you also look at ticket fees, convenience fees, handling charges, and if that has a negative or positive effect on the sales? So th what we use is the actual price that is paid. So it includes any of the fees that are there from the individual broker. So we're looking at the actual price paid because that's what matters. Um, and then, uh, I forgot the first part of your question. Oh, so you know it, it really varies in, in every individual case, but um, you know essentially variables for every opponent tend out to be significant. You can picture how many that is over a season for any of the major sports. Uh, I would say that a good 25 to 35 are what turn out to be highly relevant, by which I mean statistically significant and economically significant both. We're probably looking at a universe of 60 variables in actually doing the work, maybe 75 even. That's it? Okay. So uh, I just wanted to say before uh, we adjourn, uh, delighted to talk more. Sorry there wasn't more time for Q&A. My colleagues and I from Analysis Group will be in the back of the room. We even have a handout if you want to read more about this. But again, thank you to the student organizers. You guys, you guys are spectacular. Thank you. So.